You're walking through the woods. No one's around and your walkie-talkie doesn't work. That's when you spot it. French werewolf. It's following you, about 30 pines back. All of a sudden it breaks into a sprint. It's gaining on you. Necrotizing fasciitis. At the French-Swiss border in the 1970s, an outbreak of an unknown disease due to the ground melting would begin infecting everything on a small mountain, or assumedly everything on a small mountain. Apparently it was unusually cold and there was a recent thaw, which doesn't make much sense. Anyways, a team of researchers were sent up there to discover what was with all the cattle mutilations. As the team went dark, a second string would be sent up to discover what had happened to them and figure out why they weren't answering their walkie-talkie. Doing the smart thing, they brought no force multipliers, very little food, gear that didn't seem appropriate for the hike, and a crappy walkie-talkie that they know wouldn't even work due to like the snow and trees. But they did do something right. They brought an American, USA baby, but of course, he was a West Coast American, so European light, I'm afraid. This would spell disaster for the group as slowly but surely they began to find signs that something horrible had taken place. All the while, a type of virus or bacteria seems to have been responsible for what was happening. But how would this alter the form of the animals in the forest and ultimately what would this do to man? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode. So without further ado, let's cover the pathophysiology of the mystery disease in the found footage cold ground movie. And based on the infection patterns and changes, let's figure out how it begins its infections and what this will cause to the human body and how it eventually takes them over. So before starting, standard thing for me now, I wanted to say thank you guys for watching. I really do appreciate the support over here and on Roanoke Tales. It has been astounding. You guys are awesome. Also makes me want to shed a tear. If you end up liking the video because you liked it, uh, that always helps the things with algorithm, which in turn helps me. And subscribing if you want to stay updated weekly on videos also works. But anyhow, let's get to it. We begin our story with the understanding that this movie is supposed to be found footage, so get ready for a shaky camera that makes you want to vomit, but also, it's from the 70s, so someone slapped a film effect on this bad boy for the entirety of the movie. But I'm not complaining, I think it kind of works actually. The concept of this footage was that it was found and then digitized through an analog transfer by Helical Super 8. Now Super 8 sounds mega familiar, if I remember correctly, A24 makes Super 8 and all the movies are interconnected somehow, so I wonder if this is one of those as well. Although it's entirely possible it could just be called Super 8 for no particular reason. Now, with the actual story beginning, the first one was a fake out. We get some information. It's January 1976, nine years after the greatest car on the planet, the 1967 Impala, was made. Two reporters shortly after college were sent up to the French-Swiss border to do a report for French television where they would go missing, and then 40 years later, the footage would be found. Now, I think maybe the footage would probably be in some rough shape, but apparently it was recoverable. In 2017, the footage would be revealed to the public for reasons unknown. As the camera starts panning to pictures, Hills Have Eyes style, which uh, that movie absolutely enrages me more than probably House of a Thousand Corpses does, because I have like a massive streak of lawful good, we get a woman on the bed, and this is going to have to be blurred. My man here is just filming footage for his own personal collection. Although it's France, so maybe this would end up on French TV, I don't know. It really wouldn't surprise me. But as they talk about going to this place, they do the normal thing and shut off the camera before putting Percy in the playpen. The next morning, they begin their drive up to the mountains and discuss what they are actually investigating. The research up in the mountains has been taking place for months. Nobody has gotten got in that time frame, which would make it a criminal investigation, but livestock around the area has been disappearing in droves. Obviously, the French farmers would be getting sort of upset about the set of events, so they want to know what is going on and how they can better protect their animals. In the best Beast of Jevoudan all over again moment, which if you don't know what that is, I actually have a video over on Roanoke Tales covering it, the authorities think it's some sort of biological agent causing this, which the question comes up if they're like safe from contamination. Uh, no, you're never safe from contamination unless you're popping on your BSL-4 suit. And with an area of unknown biological contamination that the authorities are aware of and cattle being drained of blood, uh, sure, count me in, bro. No need to set up like a quarantine area. So they then stop and eat a croissant for lunch and discuss how it's a grueling three to four hour drive to the border. She asks if he's going to be okay. And he's like reluctantly like, yeah, I guess I'll make it. Uh, we also call those three to four hour drives in the U.S. going to your mom's house for Sunday dinner. I have quite a few Europeans in the Discord server that I have. It's always fun discussing distances with them. Also, Martin, you're a huge nerd. Moving on. They finally make it to the new area where this guy speaks the most guttural English I've ever heard. And he's English. So he should be able to speak English. It's just difficult to understand him. And at first, it's like maybe he wasn't facing the microphone when he spoke. But then I realized he's actually just kind of like, not slurring, but muttering everything that he says. 
His name is Gunter, and as they head inside to discuss how this case is fairly unusual, he then begins to tell them it's a multinational group conducting this research. He goes on to mention how a climate anomaly makes it rather cold on the other side of the mountain, as then Melissa asks about the virus, which the guy responds, Ah, so you've heard about the virus. Longtime listeners of this channel are about to hear me complain about the same thing I've complained about over and over again, but viruses and bacteria are totally different from one another. It's why they don't give you antibiotics for a viral infection, typically. I had to put that qualifier on there because uh, things like azithromycin can actually reduce in vitro replication of some viruses, such as rhinoviruses, influenza A, Zika virus, Ebola, enteroviruses, and coronavirus. But apart from specific instances, you won't be getting penicillin for a virus. But viruses are not interchangeable with terminology for bacteria and vice versa. The glacier is melting, but apparently temperatures are extremely low. Lower than normal, which... I'm not exactly sure how that works, but they found a new strain of bacteria, which is not a virus, yet the biologist has said, oh, you heard about the virus. Well, this bacteria, that's a virus, but a bacterial... Good Lord. Anyways, believe me, I could whine about this all day, and I probably intend to. But the point is, it is mutating life, and this virus is causing it as it's a new strain of bacteria that they've never seen before. You see how ridiculous this sounds? All is forgiven, though. I feel like back in the day, there was a concept that they could be used interchangeably in like layman's terms, but it's 2017 at this point. I'm not sure how this got lost in translation. I know the big thing is like, oh, it's current year. How could we have messed this up? But I just remember early 2000s, virus and bacteria, everybody used them interchangeably. So nowadays we don't really do that because uh, they're two different forms of life. In fact, viruses may not even be alive depending on which biologist you talk to. So the team was sent out to attempt to figure out why animals that were inhaling this new bacteria were going missing. Melissa asks where the rest of the team is as another researcher walks in saying they haven't been able to get in touch with them for days, which is always just an excellent sign of things to come. Blake Turner, police investigator, has arrived to also figure out where everyone went and why the animals have gone missing. We get some info about how a helicopter makes a run up there every two weeks, and then about four days ago was the last time it went, and everything was fine, and then they lost contact. So... They all agree to head up in the morning as it's about a three to four day hike to resupply them. But the thing to remember here is this helicopter has made several runs, so they've been up there for quite some time. The next morning, it's time to start walking. Everyone is jazzed about the walk up in the mountain as they meet up with Velma. Technically, her name is Lorianne, but I'm going to call her Velma this entire time. Uh, she, she looks like Velma. So this is about 30 minutes into the movie at this point, and then they film quite literally the whole hike up there. So strap in because it's about to be just a blast. Melissa asks what an American investigator is doing in the Swiss mountains. He has apparently been on the Snoopy case, which is basically like a horse carcass that was found devoid of organs and skin that was slightly radioactive. Its face was gone off of its skull and its mane was found 50 yards away and this took place in Colorado and he was there to kind of investigate this. Another one that was on his sort of radar was a cat carcass that had no skin on it and 30 yards around it in a circle, everything had been pressed down vegetation wise. You know, real alarming stuff. Velma apparently had her hand in a recent event that was similar because she was present at the cow autopsy, and you know, what are the odds? So the ants go marching one by one in what appears in my professional mountain hiking experience being in the foothills of Georgia, a giant circle. Velma begins talking about how she's a biologist and she thinks this is a criminal case, and it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's human intervention. At this point, they find a clearing and then stop for the evening on night one. With the tent set up, they forego a fire for some reason, and they get a lecture on how they will all be snuggling tonight as they then receive hot hands, which were game-changing in the 70s. I can only assume. He also warns them that they don't know what the chemicals do to people's skin, so don't touch it with your skin. Keep your gloves on. Well then, okay. Thanks for the heads up. Velma mentions how cold ground is much worse than the cold is now. In fact, the ground samples indicate it's colder than normal, yet somehow they were thawing. Hmm. Okay. How does that work exactly? If it's colder than the air around it, for reasons unknown because of this climate anomaly, as they were like they call it, how is it thawing when there's snow on the ground? Anyways, that night, they then hear something howling in the distance, but aren't exactly sure what it is. They assume it's just an owl of some sort, as Velma then tells them to go back to sleep. The next morning, despite how cold it is, it's also raining. I'm beginning to suspect temperatures mean nothing on this mountain. They pack up their tents as someone yells out that they found something. Running over, they find a leg bone, which in this case is not connected to the hip bone. Velma says it looks like a deer bone, but if human anatomy has taught me anything, that looks like a femur of Homo sapiens. Continuing to trudge along, 
Everyone is a little sketched out, but not too alarmed as of yet. Melissa asks Velma about what are her thoughts on a bacterial strain up here, which in one breath she says, well, there could be a virus up here, but I believe that bacteria is harmless. Bruh. Anyway, she says a bacterial strain couldn't mutate someone. Well, some bacteria does actually produce a genotoxic effect, which, what are those? I'm glad you asked. Genotoxins, as they sound, are toxins developed to affect DNA or genes. They are a class of molecule that will enter the nucleus of another cell, bypassing the cellular membrane and the nuclear envelope, where once inside, they will cause DNA damage by introducing single and double-stranded DNA breaks, which has the ability to lead to various effects, including your cells attempt to repair itself utilizing DNA polymerase, but this can also have other effects if the DNA is too damaged, such as causing the cell to undergo apoptosis, or could have even worse effects, which may lead to cancers forming if specific genes are broken at critical points. Now, could this strain of bacteria that has never been discovered before cause things like genetic sequences being inserted? It's fairly unlikely. So let's make a designation here as I'm trying to do something a little different with my videos, adding more science into the movie summary to give us a better understanding moving forward. Bacteria, as far as we know, does not have the ability to enter genetic material into a cell, but a virus is capable of having itself encoded into the cell of a person, or at least into their DNA. However, there are bacterial mechanisms that facilitate the exchange of genetic sequences between one another to make them more successful at surviving in an environment. These would be processes known as conjugation. This will cause them to share circular snippets of DNA called plasmids, which will allow for the prokaryote to take on new traits such as antibiotic resistance, which actually I used to categorize antibiotic resistance using PCR tests uh, back at my old job. It was a lot of fun. Anyways, it's highly successful in helping them survive, but it does have its drawbacks. Prokaryotes can also pick up free-floating genetic material in their environment that came from another destroyed cell and incorporate it into their functioning, which may be disadvantageous as opposed to advantageous, and considering that uh, that cell was already destroyed by something, probably not good to incorporate in your own DNA, but that's just my view on it. Anyways, so now we have to figure out, is this a bacteria or is it a virus that we're dealing with? So far, it's been rather interchangeable, making it difficult, but the genetic coding implantation process they are suggesting would point that it is most likely a virus that they have found, which would account for things that we see later. We even pull viruses up from the permafrost now and revive them, which I don't see any problem with in the future or anything like that. So it's possible, however, that just how heavily this movie calls it a bacteria that it probably is a new strain of bacteria that has leftover traits from long ago, which is important. For this concept, we need to apply what we know about the fertilization process in animals. Around 8% of the human genome is from viral coding. With that knowledge, it's hard to actually know how much of this coding had an impact on cellular activity over time. In fact, we still know that these ancient viruses do actually limit the viruses that can infect us now. It's sort of like they were there first, so they kick out other viruses and stop them from invading us. It's a very interesting concept, but it has been compared conceptually from a sperm's point of view, invading an egg is basically the same thing almost as a virus invading a cell. And with 8% of our coding coming from viruses, a question has been raised that potentially life itself draws influence from viruses and direction from viruses at some point, which caused a cell to invade another cell because that invasive cell was being directed by viral DNA. Is that not just absolutely like mind blowing? So if that is the case, then potentially this may account for the rise of things like mitochondria, if the engulfing theory is incorrect, where a cell just engulfed another that was producing too much ATP. And this mystery may also explain why we reproduce the way we do. Take all this with a grain of salt though, it's more of a thought experiment and it has not been confirmed. So if we can use this ancient beginning as a way to explain the fertilization process and then apply it to possibly a very old strain of bacteria that also invades cells, then it's possible that they have found a form of bacteria that has viral properties, but does not actually mean that it's a virus. Of course, the chances of this are exceedingly low, but given what we will see later, genetic coding implantation appears to be the only explanation for the morphological traits that we will see. As the Hon 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 squad moves up the mountain, they stop for the night as a blizzard is coming in, but this has put them behind schedule. As they talk about how cold they are, they break open more packets of hot hands, and Melissa has her concerns about the snow moving into this area. She asks about frostbite, and he says, well, it necrotizes the skin, which will then move into the muscles and then the bone. Amputation is the only way forward from there. Sort of. If the skin turns dark black, yeah, it's done. But if it can still be rewarmed in other scenarios and then doesn't refreeze, 
then you should be good to go as it should be able to be saved, but infection still is a process that might happen due to the damage to the skin itself. Nothing eventful happens that night, but as they head into the third day of the hike up the mountain, moving up a dry creek bed, Blake yells that he found something. Heading over to it, well, they found some more meat on the ground. They discuss how it could have been like a bear or a wolf that did this, but the deer body suggests that with the cuts made, it was very precise, so it was probably not an animal. They check it for radioactivity, which it appears that it does have some radioactive material on it, or it could just potentially have been the ground itself. This alarms everyone as they begin to pick up the pace. Their walkie-talkies have also completely stopped working, which if you know anything about that, uh, basically any type of radioactivity can disrupt communication. So, stopping for night three, Daniel calls back to Pinewood to try to get Gunter to get them supplies as they are running out as they are behind schedule. He said the hike takes three to four days, right? But then they only brought three days of supplies, possibly four days of supplies. That was stupid. So they all have a nice drink and then discuss how the animals that were mutilated had cauterized wounds and they had very precise cuts. So it appears to have been man-made or something similar that did it. They then hear something outside the tent. Checking outside, nothing appears to be out there moving through the trees, but then tracks are found by Mr. Cameraman Extraordinaire. They are large, as Daniel says they could have been a bear looking for some food, but he's not sure. Then Melissa calls out to David as they find some more meat on the ground. Investigating it, they find that there is a human mandible in the pile. So now it's a criminal investigation as Blake uses his raw hands to grab the jawbone and put it in a bag as Daniel calls out the pine wood again and then hears screeching in the device. Going back to the tent, they survive to the fourth morning after that fun jaunt, and while continuing their ascent, Velma ends up finding more blood in the area and then screaming. The animal is completely skinned on the ground. Daniel is up higher than the others, and then they hear an explosion, which triggers an avalanche to come down on them. They then make a break for the trees, but nobody actually makes it there from what it looks like. We then hear David breathing like a huge dork underneath the snow as he starts getting dug out. And remember, if you're ever in a similar situation as this, I've heard wiggling your arms and legs can help start spacing out the snow, and then spit to see where the snow falls. Go the opposite way, as it's always going to go towards the planet, and you need to dig up to get out. So they lost Daniel completely at this point, even after checking to see where he was at the last spot he was seen. David's ankle got broken in the process, which isn't ideal for having to hike out of there, and eventually the group decides to leave Daniel behind to get to the camp, which he was basically mostly their guy. The other guy seems to sort of know where he's at, but that's not good. Velma then spots what's left of the camp. Camp is completely destroyed by what appears to have been the avalanche, with the jeeps totally wrecked, which would have come in handy in this situation. They all huddle in the tent for the night as they agree to follow the stream out of there the next morning. As they are still there, Melissa gets pushed by something outside as Blake goes to check out what it is. He yells out for David, but comes back for the camera to film it. Following him out, they find, well, I believe it's the body of David, and that's going to have to be blurred. Of course, the issue is, it's not the avalanche that took him out. They then hear a screech in the distance as they go to check out that thing next, which is a great idea, guys. Blake sees someone in the distance, as then they find one of the researchers who, interestingly, also has no skin left. He gets up and starts his attack, or what appears to be an attack. I'm not really sure what's going on exactly, uh, but we'll find out in a moment. Because of these screeches that may have been going on, it may have been a person with a larynx problem, but we're not sure. He gets attacked by something gray and then something furry, and of course, the mountain had to have furries on it. And not just regular furries, but Swiss furries. Basically, the entire Swiss nation. This kicks off a whole set of new problems for the squad as Velma gets grabbed. So this now leaves Blake, David, and Melissa, who sit quietly in the dark until morning. As they begin their hike back down, David is slowing them up because his ankle was just completely jacked. They end up finding their tracks from the night before as they begin following those. They get to their tent, grab what they can, and then GTFO. David's leg is messed up, but sometimes you just gotta sacrifice the joint to save the meat suit. As they walk along, they hear another screech, but this one was just a bobcat. Nature's most frustrating animal because you want to pet it, but it can actually do damage to you. They stop for a rest for like a moment as Melissa talks about how she's thirsty. There's literally snow everywhere. Put some in a bottle, put it between your shirt and jacket, and in a little bit, that water will have melted just by the heat you are producing. Never eat the snow directly if you're thirsty though. It'll lower your core temperature in situations where you need body heat. But body heat that's already been lost due to radiation is free game to heat up water bottles. Blake at this point suggests that, oh, we're probably out of the creature's territory for reasons unknown. Like, how would you know you're out of the thing's territory? But they do know that it is nocturnal, as that seems to be the only time they hear it or when it attacks. So this time that you're sitting there talking would be a very good time to leave. 
Likely not walking very far, they then stop for the night to check on David's leg. He says he feels like his skin is going to come off. Hmm, interesting. Of course, that could have just been the severe frostbite on his leg that he's currently experiencing. Blake tries to tell them that they will get back tomorrow. They just need to get through tonight. He says he will go build a fire, but he needs to get firewood, so he needs to take the camera with him. As he goes out there, Melissa then goes and finds a guy near some wood, which causes her to puke and then panic. I believe maybe this was actually Daniel. Anyways, it's a nice classic. Blake then stops her from running off in the woods Blair Witch style, but where he gets grabbed and dragged off into the woods as well. She takes off back towards the tent, alerting everything in the immediate vicinity of her location as David runs up and grabs her. They decide it's probably time to get out of there around this point. Walking through, they find Blake has also been gutted and is lying there telling them to run as the things come back. So get this right, bolting out of there and going back to their tent, I have no idea why they keep thinking the tent is going to save them. They calm down, right? But then they start talking. Bro, there is literally something out there ripping people apart. Why do you have lights on? Why are you making noise? So this thing lunges at the tent because it can hear them. That scares them, and they take off running into the darkness in an unknown direction. Walking along, situation is totally foobar for all intents and purposes. But as they are able to walk far enough, eventually they are able to get to the morning before getting some nice shots of some mountains rather than, you know, keeping up the run. Of course, nothing does look familiar, which is a bit of a problem, and snow blindness is a real threat out there. Basically, that sunburn to your corneas, incredibly painful. So they come up to a group of trees with no idea if these things are still on their tail or not, and if they're going in the right direction. Heading back into the woods, David talks about how he needs to sleep because he's so tired, which is a really bad idea. You typically want to ignore that feeling when facing hypothermia if you want to get out alive. He says that his ankle hurts too much to walk any further, but given the choice between ouchies, that smarts, my anky hurts, versus a night in the woods with carnivore furries, I'm going to go with walking on my ankle. He then asks Melissa to just cut off his leg, which is an even worse idea because, bro, you can still use that broken ankle to walk. You'll be walking on a nub otherwise, which is going to be way slower. Like, this has to be the hypothermia talking at this point. So she does the old pocket knife maneuver and then uses a rock to break the bone. Good lord, that looks like tons of fun. And he actually passes out because of the pain as it snuggle up to a nice dismembered foot time and then they go to sleep for the evening. In the freezing cold, with this guy 100% bleeding out, but then they realize they probably should have gone with the I don't care if it destroys my ankle, I'm getting out of here ideology because the things start howling as they begin their attack on David, smelling the fresh tendons in the nighttime air. Melissa is now on her own as she nopes out of there, getting funneled in by these things the whole time. She's able to outrun them until the next morning, hearing whooping noises as they appear to be somewhat bipedal and covered in gray hair. As she runs, she falls into something through the ground. Moving through is clearly a cave system as she finds a desiccated carcass with an old camera and a bag. This person, well, they look like they've been here quite a while, and they seem unrelated to the researchers from earlier. Melissa then hears a growl, so she hides, and then decides it's time for a candid camera moment. Seriously, shut up and hide. As she discusses what happens, she gets attacked by one of the creatures, shockingly, but then has the wherewithal to grab the camera before taking off running. Exiting the cave, it's daylight, and she's safe. You can stop running. It's daylight, but then she runs, and she's not paying attention while it's daylight, and literally falls off a cliff, presumably to her death. Bruh, I get it, you're scared. But how did you not see a cliff coming up? And thus concludes Cold Ground. So yeah, that was depressing, but now that we've taken all the biologists and media people out, we can go on discussing what these creatures actually are. Which, if I do say so myself, is a great question, because given the fact that I think collectively we only see them for around 11 seconds the entire movie, no really, go watch this. Out of an hour and a half, we see them for an exceedingly short period of time, and this makes it difficult to understand what exactly we are dealing with and where exactly they came from. Not to mention, there are just tons of overlapping theories in the movie itself about what these things are, which is mirroring real life because you wouldn't exactly know what you're dealing with. But even looking up the lore on these things, it's really hard to find any information on them. But you know, that's never stopped Papa Roanoke from just coming up with crackpot theories anyways. <laughs> But I must warn you before launching into this, I still have multiple ideas myself on how these things actually came to be, but I believe my discussion about the infection process still holds up. Clearly, these animals, while endemic to this area, are in such a small plot of land that this would suggest a mutation of another species instead of a separate evolutionary pathway of these animals. As a result, there must be a catalyst for their creation rather than just a slow over millennia or millions of years evolutionary process. So the way I see it, 
Either we are dealing with a mutated form of man or a mutated form of something else. But I see one of those ideas as more of a qualifier to pass through different issues, and that makes it the less likely of the two events. At first, I had assumed it was some type of werewolf. Again, it's hard to see them for more than a few seconds, but after writing the summary and going to bed for the night and thinking about it, I think I have a more clear understanding based on what we see in the movie. Werewolves come from man. That much is true, which that much information is also based on just legend. But for all we know, while wolves and bears are mentioned in the movie, none of those things are seen anywhere. We also see some rabbits, which if the bunny off of Monty Python is anything to go off of, that may be the creature we're dealing with. But then we see another thing that actually points to a clue as to what these things come from. Through my expert skills at pausing the video at specific points when Melissa is running away, we can actually see them for a split second. What we see are pointed ears, a squashed face, but more importantly what appear to be wings. The howling we hear earlier isn't so much howling, but echolocation. Then given that bats that we see in the cave that Melissa falls into are showing that there's bats in the area, all this coupled with the fact that they are nocturnal and move almost silently, they appear to be some form of bat. But not just bat. I have no idea why it took me so long to figure that out. I think because of the complete lack of visual information when something would come into view. So they're potentially bat hybrids. But the question is, how do you get these giant bats? Well, therein lies the issue. It is possible that there are several factors contributing to the mutation of these creatures. But I do wonder if it's purely a bat and bacteria relationship. And we are assuming that it's bacteria at this point because... That's what specifically has been mentioned all throughout the movie. Of course, it's also been mentioned that it's a virus, but bacteria is mentioned a lot more, and there is still a possibility that, that is the correct choice, so I'm gonna go with that. The alpine-eared bat is known to be a medium-sized bat. The forearm length is approximately 1.6 inches, or 4 centimeters in non-freedom units, and the body weight is around 0.2 to 0.35 ounces, or 6 to 10 grams. As you can see, bats in general are exceedingly small creatures, given that this is considered a medium-sized bat. Hailing from the mammalian class, they are the only animal that is known to fly, apart from humans who had to build machines to do that for us, because humanity is number one, all other species get dunked on. The reason I'm making you aware of how small these bats actually are is because for a bat to go from 10 grams at maximum for medium-sized bats to 62,000 grams would be an astronomical growth that the animal would most definitely not have been able to do without congealing into one giant cancerous mass. So what's the other option then? I think you know what the other option is. Don't be coy about it. The other option is, of course, human mutation. Oh yeah, we're gonna get out there with this in the name of some gene splicing that you may not have known about. Obviously, I have to put a caveat on all this. Yes, it's entirely possible the bacteria located in the ground could have inspired the changes to the bats who already lived there. But I see the main issue is, if the bacteria had already existed for such an extended period of time and had the capability of mutating the bats in such a manner, it also should have mutated the bears and wolves at some point, but it hasn't. The other case that could be made is that the bats were in a specific cave and then were infected. However, the soil samples being taken up by the researchers would then suggest that the soil itself contained the bacteria, meaning any animal could have come across it prior, which would have resulted in the mutation. I also see that if the bats are infected and then change or had contact with the bacteria and change, then humans being exposed to this bacteria, this had to be the catalyst for this new creature to be made from man in combination with the bat genetic coding. Now, that was pretty much a mouthful, so let me explain. It's clear that with this bacteria under the ground that the bats hailing from this cave would have come into contact with the bacteria. However, if their mutation was contingent on their exposure, this means all bats exposed would have mutated into massive creatures. However, we clearly see there are still normal bats existing within the same environment. This must mean that bats being exposed haven't changed into these creatures. This may in part be due to the fact that the bats' immune systems are absolutely wild. If you are unaware, bats have an absolutely insane immune system. Through the course of their evolution, they were exposed in an enclosed area with thousands of them basically completely rubbing up against each other. Illness would spread through the population to the point that if they didn't develop some way to counter pathogens beyond the normal range of a standard mammalian immunological system, then they would have gone extinct. Essentially, unlike most animals, bats have low levels of immune responses constantly running to destroy pathogens, more so than anything that is seen with innate immunity in humans. This is accomplished through things like releasing interferons at a constant rate, and this can help them deal with viruses before they even become infected and massively decrease the effects that actually viruses can have on them. 
And in this environment, viruses can actually become deadlier, which makes them a reservoir for really bad stuff. And as a result, should that disease jump to another population, it can cause some issues. But what about bacteria? While they have amazing antiviral capabilities, bacteria seems to be something that can still regularly infect them, although the effects will be lessened by the heightened activity of the immune system. I believe this is why we see regular bats still present while mutated versions are still stalking the mountains. But why is that? And I'm just gonna lay it out there because you got places to see and people to be, or some variation of that. When the bats were infected, I believe a crossover event may have happened with the bacterial DNA. Due to the fact that it is an ancient strain of bacteria, we know that through conjugation that bacteria can exchange genetic coding. If this is the case, I wonder then if the ancient strain of bacteria infected a bat, performed conjugation, which would be more like spearing the animal cell and taking some of that bat genetic coding, but it may have been possible that the bacteria itself left strains of its own coding behind. We know with things like tumor cells, for instance, bacterial DNA can actually be brought in to the tumor and incorporated into the DNA. That's right. A human cancer cell will find bacterial DNA and think it needs to bring that into the fold. It's absolutely wild. This process is accomplished through the integrase function of the cell. So since this is possible, I believe what may be taking place is an exchange on one side that happens to result in new coding being found in the bacteria. Now you're probably seeing some issues with this already. If the coding is exchanged, then how are there still normal bats and how does that produce mutated bats? Well, that's the other thing about bats that's incredibly fascinating. Due to their near constant attack of viruses trying to change their genetic coding, bats have developed an absolutely stalwart defense against any outside invaders trying to change their DNA. For reference, there is an ABC transporter known as ABCB1 that helps them resist things like genotoxic effects, which is what bacteria can be known to release to affect DNA of nearby cells. There are also many other mechanisms by which bats protect their genetic coding from mutations, but you know who has a much weaker version of that? Humans. I believe this exchange will leave the bat largely unchanged by the bacteria considering their own immune systems and genetic stability concerning influenza pathogens. It's pretty much negated. But once this bacteria is altered and was brought up by humans, they became infected with something that would go on to alter the very structure of their body. Now, again, a bit of a caveat with this, we are treading outside of established lore because the reality is there's virtually no lore to explain what these creatures are, apart from bacteria has the ability to mutate. That is the only thing we're told. And these things appear like giant bats, but there are still regular bats and humans are being hunted. So join me on this coffee field explanation on how humans are altered because that's what I'm gonna go with. Once the bacteria was discovered, humans would obviously have been interested. Sort of like how we bring up megaviruses from the permafrost nowadays and think, hmm, you know, this would be really fun to bring back to life to see the effects. Because all labs are built the same. And there's not countries out there who have lab leaks like a bunch of idiots and then try to cover up and pretend like they aren't responsible. Anyhow, before I get on my soapbox, because nobody wants to hear that, it's likely the researchers and biologists at some time did not have the proper PPE when dealing with the infection. As the bacteria entered their body, it may be possible that some of the DNA from the bat made its way into the bacteria, which then that bacteria induced mutations within the human genome, meaning that it has the ability to directly interface with an animal's DNA. And from here, I think you can kind of see how it goes. The bacteria would likely pick up some of the genetic coding from a human, but with Homo sapiens, absolutely pitiful genetic stability in comparison to the bat at the helm. Any changes brought on by integrase would not be located in time by the counters put in place to watch a cell's coding. When this happened, genes that were never meant to be human or never meant to be in our coding would begin expressing. Because remember, human cells under certain conditions can bring in other genes that are not supposed to be there from completely different organisms. It would likely change a person slowly enough at first, but there's a huge gap in knowledge as to what actually happened on the mountain during the infection process. Again, I suppose it's possible that they are just regular mutated bats. I just severely doubt that bats could grow that size from a simple mutation, and given the level of nutrition that they would need to grow an entire pack that size, it would require more than just a few cattle mutilations, and not to mention the number of cells that they were working with to expand that far outwards would induce so many mitotic genetic mutations, the thing would be non-viable. So I believe that when the whole team went missing, 
that's when some began to change. Because remember, they had apparently been up there for several weeks, possibly even months, with absolutely no issue. But then, supposedly, after discovering this bacterial strain, did they start having issues? This was the infection point for the team. Once infected, the bat genes would begin expressing in their own bodies and would appear to have induced some physiological changes, such as skin membranes forming on their arms and their facial structures changing, albeit it was almost impossible to get a good look at them. On top of this, I also don't find it odd that these things were roughly human-sized. Because you have to ask yourself, why would it make it more advantageous for a bat to grow at that size and stop? Why not the size of a bear or a wolf or a bobcat to scoop up smaller prey? Why human size? Because they were humans. They just had their features changed by the bacteria, altering the genome of a human and inadvertently implanting bacterial DNA that was laced with bat DNA. This seems to be the most probable catalyst because as it started, a person is infected, their skin begins having issues, which in my mind would mean the body is altering its shape and the external organ is kind of helping to take on the characteristics of bat skin to form itself, to become something more as a hybrid and an expression of both individual organisms. So to be honest with you, this issue would have been a non-issue in the United States because I personally don't go hiking without some sort of counter to the local fauna and considering these things may possibly be a form of mutated human influenced by bat DNA, there's an old saying, if it can bleed, you can kill it. But because it's in Europe, uh, the lead isn't really an answer. So just sharpen a stick. If you know these things are after you, why in the name of all that is holy would you not make a spear? Anything is better than nothing. It seems like when these creatures attack as well, they aren't too effective at taking prey down their own size, which is an average human. They can cause grievous wounds if they get too close and you didn't have a sharp stick. They do seem to leave you alone after a little while. So just, again, sharpen a spear. What are you guys doing? But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leave a like would be fantastic as it helps get this into the algorithm. Leaving a comment on what you think these things also are is also greatly appreciated because I may have missed something, but I think these are mutated humans. I don't think these are just mutated bats. So let me know what you guys think. But subscribing is also a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my Twitter that was recently unhacked. Discord, Patreon, and Roto Tales link in the description. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut, Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you, Broham. I'd also like to thank Best Dancer, our astrophysicist, as well as our scientists, Countryside Limbo, Lacune, Logan Satomi, and Tyson Nakanishi. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way and keeps lights running around here, so it's greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.